Covalent bonding is a sharing of electrons. It's different from ionic bonds, where one atom just completely gives up its electron to a different atom. In covalent bonding, two atoms are sharing electrons. You can see in the illustration how these hydrogen atoms are sharing electrons to form a bond. It might help you understand covalent compounds a bit better if you compare and contrast that to ionic compounds which we've already studied. In an ionic compound, a metal usually gives up its electrons to the nonmetals. Meanwhile, in a covalent compound, electrons are usually shared between two or more nonmetals. Covalent compounds only have nonmetals in them. Ionic compounds are held together by strong electrostatic forces between oppositely charged ions. This results in a crystal lattice structure such as the ones seen in sodium chloride, and it explains their unusually high melting point. On the other hand, covalent bonds are much weaker than ionic bonds because the electrons are being shared by the atoms. This results in unusually low melting and boiling points, and you can see for carbon dioxide, its sublimation point, the point at which it turns from solid to gas, is negative 78.5 degrees Celsius. Meanwhile, sodium chloride will only boil if it reaches an extremely high temperature of 1,465 degrees Celsius. For ionic compounds, you're going to rely on the crisscross method which we discussed in the ionic compounds naming and writing formulas video series. So you will crisscross the charges, keep the name of the metal, and then change the ending of the nonmetal to ide, ite, or ate. For covalent compounds, it's different in that the prefixes will tell you how many there are. You won't rely on the crisscross method because you don't have to, so really all you do is just put the prefix in front of the metal, put the prefix in front of the nonmetal, and then change the ending to ide. When I look at this compound here, I see and I notice that the elements involved are only nonmetals. Okay, we're looking at water, so we know that it's just hydrogen and just oxygen, which makes it a covalent compound. I don't see metals anywhere, so I know by default this thing is probably covalent. So if it's covalent, it's going to follow a different set of rules where I don't need to crisscross the charges like I did for ionic compounds. We know that the common name is water. The chemical name is dihydrogen monoxide. Okay, so if you look at the formula, it's H2O1. Well, dihydrogen means there are two hydrogens because I'm using the prefix chart that's above me and the number of atoms is two, and the prefix I will choose has to be di. So dihydrogen, two hydrogens, and the prefix mono means one. So when you put it all together, you have monoxide, monooxide. So th there's a weird language rule where if you have a double vowel, it gets omitted, so then you just call this thing monoxide instead of monooxide. So monoxide means one oxygen, so dihydrogen, Monoxide is the chemical name for water because the formula is H2O. Every year someone falls for this website. Okay, this is called dihydrogen monoxide, the truth. Okay, it's found in every lake, river, and ocean. It's a major part of acid rain. It corrodes metal. And then they give you stuff like the dihydrogen monoxide scare tactics. But really, dihydrogen monoxide is just water. If you have any basic understanding of the Greek prefixes for the numbers, then naming covalent compounds and writing their formulas is extremely easy. If you could do one or two, that means you can do the rest on this type of topic. I'll just go through these real quickly from top to bottom. The only thing that you really have to understand is the prefixes always go in front of the element. Next, you will not change the name of the leading element, the one that's in the front, but you will change the ending of the trailing element to ide, just like how we did for ionic compounds. So you'll see here in this example, that's boxed in green, N2S4 is our formula. So then we know that there are two nitrogens and four sulfurs. Well then I'm gonna look to my prefix chart on the left, and I know that I will have to use di, which means two, and tetra, which means four. So again, the prefixes always go in front of the element, so then we will call this thing dinitrogen, which means two nitrogens, and then tetrasulfide, so the ending becomes ide, sulfur becomes sulfide, and we got tetrasulfide, which is four sulfurs. So you put it all together, you have dinitrogen, so the ending is unchanged, four nitrogen, dinitrogen, tetrasulfide. 
The formula here is Ni3. There are no metals in this compound, so because it's only nonmetals, it's going to follow the covalent naming rules. So Ni3, we're just going to call this thing nitrogen triiodide. So there is no need for the mono nitrogen if the leading element only has one. Okay, you can actually omit the mono if it's the leading element. So just call this thing nitrogen. Tri means three. Nitrogen triiodide, Ni3. XeF6 is xenon hexafluoride. CCL4, so again, think of this as C1Cl4 because there's just one carbon. You can just call this thing carbon tetrachloride. You don't have to call it monocarbon tetrachloride because carbon is the leading element and there's only one of carbon. So again, carbon tetrachloride works just fine. P2O5 is called diphosphorus pentoxide. So again, drop the A or the O before oxide because it's an English language rule where if there's a double vowel, just omit that vowel. And then you just call it pentoxide instead of pentaoxide because that sounds awkward. Just omit the A, call it pentoxide. Last one on the list is SO3, so it's S1O3, so monosulfur trioxide. Again, omit the mono in front of sulfur, and you can just call it sulfur trioxide. Covalent compounds are found everywhere in everyday life. They are found in the human body where they carry out important chemical reactions. They're also found in common household items such as ammonia and vinegar and laundry detergent. So for example, acetic acid is a covalent molecule that basically makes up vinegar. Ammonia, or nitrogen trihydride, is used as fertilizer to grow crops on farms. You also have carbon dioxide, which has been the center of many discussions. It is a greenhouse gas that is responsible for global warming. And finally, for pity's sake, do not ban dihydrogen monoxide. Because as you now know from your covalent naming rules, that dihydrogen monoxide is just water. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time on Wind Chemistry.